So I'm not going to lie to you. This week sucked. I mean big time. I mean theologically, I mean personally, I mean professionally, I mean it sucked in all the ways possible. The loss of loved ones, the poor excuse of leadership in our government, both at the congressional level and in the White House, the racist and Islamophobic social media pages of my family, the inability of us to treat one another well in our places of work and our volunteer efforts. It was as though all of my life took a trip right down the proverbial toilet. I'm going to tell you, I didn't really know what to do. I sat in that toilet bowl, circling around and around and around, just waiting to be sucked down the drain. I really didn't know what to do. I was feeling sad, mad, not glad, definitely scared. And then I questioned whether this world was actually going to be a better place. I questioned whether we are more than just the end of our existence. Would my family actually change their racist and Islamophobic beliefs or behaviors? How were we going to hold one another accountable for our words and actions while still engaging in the difficult work of making community? I had no answers, and I was getting dizzy. So I reached out. I reached out to friends. I reached out to Reverend Leslie. While she is a colleague, sometimes she is also my minister. I did Google searches. I needed something, something that would help me remember. I felt this, this call to be reminded that I really do believe in the potential of humankind. You see, just like the seed has the capability of becoming the tree or the flower, I think we have the ability to be much more than we are at any given point in our lives. This holding of potentiality is for me best described by the word hope. However, it's really hard to hold on to hope when you're circling a drain pipe. In my various discussions with friends and colleagues and the research that I did this week, I was reminded of novels and TV shows and movies that have reinforced in me this belief that we can become more. For me, I was instantly taken back to my 16-year-old self when I picked up the autobiography of the civil rights leader Malcolm X. For me, it is one of those works that demonstrates the power of becoming. I found a summary online in my Google searching from activist and organizer Gloria Verdue who suggests that Malcolm had four stages of becoming in his life. The first, we see him as a child, Malcolm Little. By the age of 13, he had seen his house burn down. He had been exposed to the violent death of his father by racists and had seen the slow mental breakdown of his mother. On top of all of that, his brothers and sisters were placed in foster care. The second Malcolm, a teenager, searched and examined the values of his peer group, which included the zoot suit and burning the, the burning of their scalp with chemicals, just enough to approximate the appearance of white men's hair. The third Malcolm stood up for his people when black people were being beaten in the streets, publicly humiliated and killed, he understood that people like himself in the streets and in the prisons, they all had contributions to make to the larger society. Finally, she argues that the fourth Malcolm announced his split with the Nation of Islam in March of 1964. He then made the pilgrimage to Mecca where he encountered people of all races many different fighters against all kinds of oppression. At that point, he spoke to whites as well as blacks. 
I remember my 16-year-old self really admiring the stories of Malcolm. It was his resilience that I connected with. The only thing that I can say is to me, Malcolm X had to be a hopeful person. I realize now that my troubled week wasn't really all that bad. Sure, it had some ups and downs, but reflecting back on it, what made it so awful was the fact that I had given up hope. I, I was really no longer able to see the potential of myself to change, let alone find a way to believe that possibility for another person. In his book titled Making Hope Happen, Gallup Poll senior scientist Dr. Shane Lopez cautions us that hope is like oxygen. We need it to live. His research exposed two main characteristics of hopeful people. The first is the belief that the future will be better than the present. He refers to this as optimism. And the second characteristic is that we actually have the power to make that better present real. He calls this the characteristic of agency. He insists that the data showed that when we have both optimism and agency, the result is hope, and it is powerful. His research found that workers who had exhibited the characteristics of hope were 14% more productive in their workday than non-hopeful counterparts. Likewise, when he aimed his research at students, he, he found that hopeful students were 12% more successful than non-hopeful students, often by an entire letter grade. Now, his research took a deeper dive and look at the concept of agency. He found that this meant not just having the belief that we can affect the future, but that we remain realistic about the efforts, specifically that we will need multiple approaches with multiple hands helping us out, and very importantly, we must embrace the fact that many of these multiple approaches will fail. Doesn't sound so hopeful, does it? And you might be wondering where I'm going with this, but hang on. There's hope. As I read more about this research, I was reminded of a theological framework that sounded very familiar to his writings. And I understand that Reverend Leslie is teaching a class on Wednesday evenings at 7.30 called Beliefs That Build Hope, and that this past week's topic was, in fact, this theological framework I was reminded of. It's called Process Theology. It was created by an English mathematician and philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, shortly after the death of one of his children during World War I. Essentially, this mode of philosophy suggests that reality is not simply a bunch of matter that exists independently of one another, but instead, as he says, it is a web of interrelated processes of which we are integral parts, so much so that all of our choices, all of our actions have consequences for the world around us. This complex relational definition of the world that we live in really gives new meaning to the Jewish, Islamic, and Christian definition of God. No longer is there an entity that is essentially playing chess with our lives, but rather, in its place, is this complex relationship between all that was, all that is, and all that ever could be. These complex and chaotic relationships work with one another in amazing and miraculous ways to lure the world toward a more expansive love and ultimate peace. And so, I return back to the research of Dr. Lopez. This world, through our intentional interactions, 
all of those interactions that succeed and every one of those interactions that fail work to move the world toward betterment. Yeah, that makes sense to me. The loss of loved ones, the poor excuse of leadership in our government, both at the congressional and at the White House level, my family's racist and Islamophobic social media pages, the inability of us to treat each other well in our places of work and volunteerism, these are all examples of failed relationship building. But they're not the ultimate end of the story. Instead, through the lens of process theology, they are just pieces of the chaotic cosmic process that is ever unfolding. Now, you may not agree with this philosophy. It may not fit into your belief system nor your lived experience. But what if? What if it is the way that the universe works? What if Whitehead got it right? After all, in Unitarian Universalism, we often quote our seventh principle as respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. It's very easy to blindly paint that phrasing as environmental responsibility. But through the lens of process theology, I think it is much, much more. To me, the interdependence of our seventh principle is really best described by womanist and process theologian and faculty member at Claremont Theological School, the Reverend Dr. Monica Coleman, also a process theologian, when she responded to an interview question of what brings her hope. She answers her students. They are passionate and persistent. They give me hope that one church at a time one community organization at a time. Somewhere in that oneness, there will be a generation that is more loving and more just. In both process theology and Dr. Lopez's concept of hope, we have to remain optimistic for a more whole and loving future world. It's important, that optimism. And we must remain actively engaged. It is only in the active engagement that our hope is actually realized and moves the world toward wholeness. This was a profound recognition for me. I come from a faith tradition originally that really was big into blind hope, blind optimism, optimism where the future was set for me by a deity outside of my effect or control. That was lovely. That blind optimism kept me hopeful for many, many, many years. But it's what Dr. Lopez calls wishful thinking. Optimism without accountable actions is wishful thinking. So think about that. That's not what we're doing here today. We're intentional in our actions. Sure, we may have hope for a better future, but we're Unitarian Universalists. We're willing to roll up our sleeves and make it so. That's why we woke up today. That's why we got dressed. That's why we drove here, some of us far, some of us near, just to come here, to be together, to worship something that is bigger than all of us combined, something that we know is real, even if we can't give it a name. We know we've experienced it. It's in the smile of a new parent. It's in the tears of a mother who lost her child before she was ready. It is in the warm embrace and tender kiss of lovers. It's in the heart-filled act of making coffee, purchasing cookies. It is in the act of putting away tables and chairs, giving of your time, talent, and treasures to this community. These are all the simple acts of hope that remind me that it's all worth it. So this week, when things undoubtedly don't go the way I originally planned, I'm going to remember to anchor my optimism 
and ground myself in those small actions that will work to move my relationships more positive, more loving, and into more peaceful states. I invite you to join me in moving this world slowly but steadily toward love.